What's up, everyone? Welcome back to your second ever episode of Collider Forces. I am so happy to call Rachel Morrison my second guest on this show. Hello, congratulations on everything you accomplished. And specifically today, we are celebrating your incredible work on The Mandalorian. Well, thank you. Fittingly, episode number two of the third season. <laughs> I feel like that was meant to be. I would love to say I planned it that way, but <laughs> that's, that's not how it went. So the first order of the first order of business on Collider Forces is we play a game called Dicey Questions. I've got a dice tower behind me and I roll the die three times and whatever I roll for you, it corresponds to a question. And those are the three questions we start with. Perfect. All right. Number eight. Number eight, we're calling other jobs. If you could learn more about a different job on a film set, which job would you choose and why? Ooh, interesting. Um, well, now that I've done like proper post on a feature, I'm fully um, fascinated by and uh, overwhelmed by music composition, you know, composing score for, for a film. That was definitely an area that I knew nothing about. And uh, I think with anything in life, like that's what I want to learn is the thing I know the least about. Oh, this is this is my son Wiley. Wiley, come say hi. You can't walk past the camera and not introduce yourself. This is Wiley. Hi, Wiley. Wiley How's hi. it going? Wiley actually made a, a cameo in ep what episode was episode one of Mando? Not my episode, but a different episode. Wiley, who did you play? She said, "Who did you play?" He runs in the background. He's like in the town. You just pause the frame perfectly, and you can kind of catch him blurry in motion. Right. I love it. That's an A plus cameo right there. All right, I have your second roll on the tower. Okay. All right, we are wrapping this up with a number seven. Number seven is a nice, easy one. It's wrap gifts. What is the best wrap gift you've ever received or given on a project? Ooh, um, given, you know, my background's in photography. So I tend to, although I've done it less now that iPhones have gotten better, but I used to have a really nice camera on set all the time. And I was it's almost like what I would do when I got impatient while like my gaffer, my crew was lighting, I would just take photos. And so I would personalize photographs of all of my department heads of, you know, other people on set. Um, so that's probably the best I've given. The best I've received um, is also usually photo books, not this time, not crafted by, by the, the person giving me the gift, but just, you know, photo books that speak to like Rick on this gave me, I think a, a book of surfing photographs because, you know, they love to surf. Um, so yeah, usually it's usually trading an art in some way, shape or form. I feel like even with how advanced iPhones have gotten, there's still like, you still can't recreate that magic from, from a proper camera. Oh, not, not at all. Yeah. And I never will be able to just by virtue of depth of field and things like that. But Yes, absolutely. All right. We have hit our first official question of Collider Forces. They always start here. We go back to the, the very, very beginning. I want to know, actually, I think I have to ask you this. What was the first goal for you? Was it to become a director or to become a cinematographer? And then what also sparked it? Definitely cinematography, um, you know, and, and predating that was photography, but I, I, I realized as soon as I sort of discovered film in a real way and, and understood what the role of the cinematographer was, that was the end goal and really continued to be, if they were still making hundred million dollar dramas, I would probably still be shooting. I think I just hit this wall where suddenly um, the movies of my childhood that I dreamed of making one day are not made in the same form, right? Like a lot of the character drama has gone to television and the $100 million movies are all superhero movies, um, give, or, give or take. And so I started to pivot when I realized that like I got to the target a little too late. But I loved cinematography. I still love cinematography. That said, the more I, the more I direct, the more I fall in love with directing as well. And so maybe it was a, a happy accident that I was forced to kind of take a, a career, career right or left turn, but I, I'm really, um, I'm in new love, you know, with, with directing, but I always, I grew up loving cinematography. I have so many follow-up questions. The first one that I wanted to ask was, you said initially that the dream was to, to get into photography. Do you remember your first experience with film and seeing that style of photography that made you switch gears and want to pursue that format instead? 
Well, it was the discovery of independent film. Like I, I grew up in Cambridge and I had, you know, spent my childhood going to the big marquee blockbuster theaters. And then as soon as I wandered into the, you know, Harvard Square Independent Theater or the Brattle Theater and I started to watch foreign films and, you know, old classics, like that was where my mind, you know, everything sort of shifted for me. And I think it was the moment of whether it was a particularly emotional film or something, but like realizing that I had had this fully transformative, cathartic, sometimes very emotional, like teary experience in a film that I'd never, no matter how much photography meant to me and spoke to me, a single photographic image had never brought me to tears or transformed the way I sort of existed. So I think that that was the other thing was just realizing that the power of, of a full journey that one could take in it in a 90 minute, you know, plus experience was, was just not something I could match with photo. Okay. I'm going to back pocket my other follow-up question as we sure. get into some of your directing credits, but I wanted to go back to your reality TV experience because as someone who grew up on MTV reality shows, I just, I can't help myself. I have to ask, what was it like working on Room Raiders specifically? And oh, please geez. tell me the wildest thing you shot, you shot on that show. Room Raiders, um, things that things things that you wish you could bury from the past. Although it's interesting, like I cross paths still with some of the, my friends, you know, camera other camera operators on reality shows or producers. Like one of the film filmmakers, one of the people that I did reality TV on, on Room Raiders with, went on to do all of um, uh, Bourdain's. You know, what was his show called? I guess it was, was it called Bourdain. Um, anyway, like, but um. It was, at the time, it was a way to stay afloat. I had all the school debt and it was, somebody was paying me to run around with a camera all day and I was just excited to get paid to shoot. Um, what was some of the craziest stuff? I, I mean, it was all, in retrospect, it was all crazy in that we were like putting hidden cameras in underwear drawers and closets and all of these things that I wish I could go back and, and not ever do again. Um, but yeah, I'm very grateful to have come pretty far from there. When you started going down the reality TV path, was it the type of situation where the more you the more you shot in that particular realm, the more difficult it could feel to pivot back to working in another format where there was a concern about getting boxed in? Yes, very much so. I mean, that was actually uh, I so Room Raiders was right after the first kind of faux internet boom fail, right? Like I I, I got out of school undergrad at the time and had a minute where I was actually shooting really cool documentaries and traveling around the world and Argentina and Russia and just doing, doing things that were much closer to, to my heart. And then that first kind of internet fail happened and suddenly we were all unemployed. And, and the thing that kind of got people getting paid again, at least in my world, was reality TV. And I knew, even though the money for a you know, 21 year old or whatever I was, was good. It, it was so far from what I actually wanted to do. And I definitely felt like found myself. Yeah. It felt like I, I was getting further from the dream, not closer to it. Um, and so I ended up going to AFI to really focus on cinematography and came out with so much debt again, that I ended up back in reality TV to sort of pay, pay off some of the, the, the debt I was in. But, but gave myself a deadline. And it was like, as soon as I hit this mark with, you know, whatever, getting out of the, the some of the, fi the financial weight or financial debt weight that I was going to stop and, and really focus on film. And, and that's what I did. And, and in that case, it was the Hills. But when I quit the Hills, it was like, I'm never doing, you know, I, I made a pact to myself to kind of never do it again. And, and fortunately, I haven't had to. So post the hills of all of your earliest shows and films that you worked on, which one would you credit with putting into perspective the types of stories you were most passionate about telling and the types of sets you wanted to work on? I mean, without a doubt, Fruitvale Station was the film that, you know, was transformative in so many ways. But it, interestingly, the way I ended up on Fruitvale was because I had met with Elise McKimmy at the Sundance Labs about potentially doing the labs. And she had me describe the kind of movie I wanted to make. And at the time, this was a year before Ryan was looking for a DP, but I had inadvertently described Fruitvale. So then a year later, I mean, I really credit her for just cataloging and remembering, because I didn't end up doing the labs. 
but she remembered this conversation we had had. And when Ryan was looking for a DP and he wanted somebody, this is actually to bring reality full, full circle or documentary full circle. He wanted somebody who had a background in documentary, you know, and single camera, subjective storytelling, you know, making decisions on the fly, lighting for lighting for a singular experience, experiential filmmaking, whatever. And so th that actually came into play in me getting hired. But that was the movie that, you know, I, I felt, I mean, m more so now than even then, but like, I, I feel like with, with filmmaking, we have a chance to deliver some form of messaging in an entertaining package, which is a, a way to you know, potentially reach across an aisle or, I mean, it's just, it is a universal language, right? It's a, it's, it's, it's a visual medium that, that transcends language barriers and cultures and all these things. And it's a chance to build empathy and put people in other people's shoes and all these things. And so Fruitvale was a movie that was like, this is, this is where I'm trying to go. Um, and then ended up being obviously the launching pad for a much bigger, more rewarding career. So I'll stick with Ryan for a minute here and yeah. jump over to the MCU. What is something about the way the two of you collaborated on Fruitvale Station that stayed exactly the same and that you were happy about when you jumped over to Black Panther? But then on the other hand, what is something about the Marvel production process that required a little bit of a learning curve for you? I mean, the whole thing, for obvious reasons, was a huge learning curve, um, in part because I wasn't able to do Creed with Ryan because I was having my first baby, like l literally in the middle of the show. Like we would have maybe been able to finagle it if I was just pregnant, but I was due in the middle of the shoot. So for me, it was a leap from really, truly small budget independent filmmaking to massive scale Marvel filmmaking, you know, in part because I'd been shut out of the bigger budget movies for so long. I think it's definitely started to shift, but coming up as a female DP five, 10 years ago, it was like, I just had to keep proving myself to get even a few more million dollars, let alone. So, so for Ryan to actually have made the case for and won the case for getting me hired on Panther is a real testament to him. But in terms of, I would say, what carried over, it is the subjective experiential filmmaking. It's hand, a lot of handheld. I mean, I, I operate as much as I can. I actually didn't on Panther, which was very hard for me, but, um, but it, it's, uh, close eye lines and really kind of connective filmmaking. Like I think one thing, um, you know, when we were making Black Panther, we had two camera bodies and we would oftentimes only shoot with one. And our, you know, big, big brother, big sister Avengers was like over at Pinewood and I think they had 12 camera bodies. And it's just a different, it's a different style of filmmaking, right? Like they were kind of going for some of the most, the coolest car flips and the most exciting action sequences and we were really like to us, the movie was going to succeed on, on the connective material and kind of whether you felt, you know, if you felt something as two people were looking at each other. And, and for that, you almost want a, a, a single camera because the second you start to cram more cameras in, you're kind of comp compromising the eye lines, compromising maybe the, the exact focal length or the, for, you know, the, the, the framing that you want, I kind of everything becomes a little bit of a compromise and maybe you gain a second angle, but you're losing something. But um, yeah, so, and I, and I also just think, um, I mean, Ryan and I have a very similar sensibility in terms of, you know, wanting to really put people in our characters, you know, lives, I guess, for, for the two minutes, two hours that we have them captive. You feel it. it makes all the difference in yeah, the world. So yeah. that was a, that was a, pretty big milestone that you sparked for the industry, as is your Oscar nomination, which is a very big deal. And I like to ask this question a lot because I feel like a lot of people, they hear someone's been nominated for an Oscar and all of a sudden everything has changed for the better and they have all the opportunities at their fingertips. So I got a two-parter two on that for you. What is a misconception about what it means to get Oscar nominated and what comes after that? But then also, what is something that actually did change for the better because you got that kind of recognition? Ooh, good questions, hard questions. Um, misconception. I mean, I think you named it. It's not, it's not quite like the floodgates open. I think uh, in the same way that people still like to pigeonhole hole you for the thing that you do. Like I made this actually very small movie that got nominated for an Oscar. So it's not like I, well, I think part of it too is that they're really not making that many hundred million dollar dramas anymore. 
but it wasn't like the floodgates open to all of my dream hundred million dollar dramas. The hundred million dramas are like, you know, Nolan has his DP, um, Scorsese has his DP. Like they're, they're not, nobody's on the hunt for a new, I mean, none of the big mega filmmakers who have those kind of budgets were on the hunt for a new DP. So, so the scripts that I was getting, if anything, I felt like they weren't as good as the versions of the things that I had made, like, you know, big movies that weren't Black Panther, small movies that weren't Mudbound and weren't as makeable. Like Mudbound, some, I mean, it was a miracle that we were able to pull off a period film for, a, I think it was like $9 million budget. But in trying to make another period film for a nine million, or, you know, roughly nine or $10 million budget afterwards that was not set in the South and was not that specific, it was really not enough money. And so I, I think I just actually found that in a weird way for me anyway, rather than try to outdo these accomplishments that I had made, it was, I, that was, it, it was the right time to pivot to directing, which was more and more kind of had been percolating and the Ryan Kuglers of the world, the Rick Thumme was all these people had been telling me like, you should direct, you think like a director, you have stories to tell, get out there. And so I think it was like, okay, I hit this amazing career milestone. Let me start over and start from the bottom and try this other new thing um, that has been, you know, piquing my curiosity. And then what was the other question? What was? That was the, so that was the biggest misconception, something that actually did change for the better. Um, I mean, I definitely think, I'm not going to credit myself for this by any means, but it was around that time where doors started to open, you know, for bigger films for women and for like, I think it, it, it helped to show that it could happen. Um, and um, I don't know. I mean, it is, it is, it's a, the MGM just cut a trailer for my movie, which is not coming out for God knows how long, unfortunately, but even in seeing the trailer, the, the, it, like it comes up with uh, Oscar nominated filmmaker, Rachel Morrison and written by Oscar award winner, Barry Jenkins. And just seeing like the power of that, like I felt it. I actually, I mean, I turned beat red because I've been hiding from the spotlight my whole life and it's a little strange suddenly being thrust into it, but you can kind of never take that back. You know, you do, it is this thing that's like not that many people get to get to, you know, get to say that they were nominated for something. So it's cool. Tis a, tis a mighty good spotlight to be in. Yeah. Um, a good spotlight that I'm very happy you're in. Before I jump into Mando Full Force now, just in terms of making the pivot to directing, what would you say was the biggest challenge when trying to get your foot in the door and convince the industry that you are a cinematographer and now you are also a director too? I think, interestingly, my honest answer was is my belief in myself. I didn't have, I've been very fortunate. The first directing opportunity I was given came from John Ridley, who uh, wrote 12 Years a Slave, but was, was show running the show called American Crime. And based off of a conversation we had had, and based off my work as a DP, he was the one who was like, I want you to direct these episodes. And, and I, I sort of wavered for a second because I wasn't sure if I was ready. And this is now several years, many years ago. Um, and I did it and it went great. And that was sort of when the floodgates to episodic directing opened. And for me at the time, I, I, I wasn't ready to close the door. I had, I knew I still had a, a mob out and a black Panther in me. So I, I actually told all my directing agents at the time to like, let's wait. I want to focus on shooting. I'll let you know when I'm ready. And like five years almost just shot. And then when I was ready to direct, I kind of, I was like, okay, guys, I'm ready now. But I think, it was me believing that I, I was ready or that I was, that it was time or that I could handle, you know, it really is the working with actors. Cause that was never my training. My training was always in the technical, the lighting, the camera, the camera movement, you know, film exposure. I mean, back when we were printing first photography and then in film, but like cell, you know, celluloid and film development, all of these things, almost the math and science of it but I had never trained with working with actors except that I had been absorbing it over the year. I mean, I've now been doing this for the better part of two decades and seeing what worked, what didn't. I mean, as an, as a DP operator, I think I'm often the closest to the actor, especially if you have a director who's behind a monitor. So sort of seeing an actor like be so vulnerable and then look up at you and be like, did I get it? And, and then, and, and always knowing instinctive, like I think even as an operator, knowing, when it was like that magical take or when they needed another, like, 
And I think I, 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 um, I just had to give myself permission to lead the charge. Um, and then, yeah, like once I started, started leading, I was like, I'm pretty good at this. Like this is working out all right. So I'm going to stick with it, I guess. Yeah. I think that's a pretty smart move right there. All right, pivoting into Mando now. So not that you don't have experience working on big, high-pressure franchises like this, but Star Wars, there's 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 a lot on your shoulders when you commit to jumping into this particular film series. So was committing to directing an episode of The Mandalorian a no-brainer when the opportunity came up? Or was there any, you know, like a burning question or things that you needed to iron out before you felt comfortable with jumping into it? I mean, I wanted to be transparent with everybody that I am not like, I I feel like historically, a lot of the people who work in the Star Wars universe work there because it is their world, right? They live, eat, breathe it. They know they're, they're comic book nerds, they're junkie, they're Star Wars junkies. And they come into it with this encyclopedia of knowledge. Um, And I think that that was true of at least the first few seasons of, you know, Mando directors or first season and a half. And then... I think that they made a conscious decision in some part to bring in some people who maybe like could bring something different to the table. But so I, I wanted everybody to, um, like, there was no pretense that I was this wealth of, of Star Wars knowledge because I, I wasn't. Um, but I also feel like my episode was almost handpicked for me. Like it was a very visual episode um, with, you know, it's, I think it's just, and baby gets to save the day, which is always fun. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that the other, I mean, it was a no brainer for a couple of reasons. I was curious about the volume, which is, you know, the technology that was really, um, uh, Mandalorian set, set the stage for this whole new way of, of filming things. And I had, I had seen it in action, but I'd never actually been the person behind, you know, behind the lens for it. And so that was, that piqued my curiosity, Rick, who, who, was a supervising producer on, on that season, supervising producer, director. Um, he and I are very close. We've shot movies together. I think he, like, I trusted him. If he, you know, he, he thought I'd be good for this. And I was like, okay, I, I trust your judgment on that. Um, and yeah, I think I was just, what's, I was also just, what's all the fuss about? I want to, I want to meet baby Grogu and, and, and take this wild ride. And, and yeah, it was, it was really fun. Um, so yeah. So you brought up the idea of collaborating with actors being a new thing when you became a director. And it's making me very curious now, what is it like directing a character like Din Djarin where, you know, Pedro's the final performance, his final voice performance, I imagine is something you don't have access to while you're filming. So so what is the key to, I guess, crafting that performance in a way that you could shoot what you need and know it'll all come together in the end? Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. One of the things I always, I really have always loved a good challenge. Like I I think I'm drawn to things that I haven't done before or that feel challenging in some way. So I think there was actually this part of me that was excited by how do you get emotion out of, you know, a, a, a man in a mask and a puppet effectively. Right. And, um, so I wanted to be able to try to answer it for myself, knowing obviously that these first couple of seasons have are working. So some somehow they are they are getting emotion and and character out of you know despite these challenges but um i the, to answer your question that they, they do um pedro pre tape they they do a first pass of the script so you have some sense of what's being said and, and, and kind of the intonation inflection all of that um and how it's all working and and we're prevising things I mean, we're working a lot out before we actually get in there um, but then you also have the benefit of it's like a, a, a Christmas of, of ADR, right? Like you can always change the lines later, um, which is not something you get to do in, in most circumstances. So I think that that's a nice, uh, the nice kind of uh, cushion, cushion to fall back on, I guess. All right. I don't want to let you go without asking about your Mythosaur shot, which is a, a really, really big deal for the Mandalorians and for the franchise overall. So I was curious, what is the biggest difference between how you first envisioned capturing that particular moment and then what we see in the finished episode? Did that evolve at all? Did you try any new techniques? I don't know if I'm allowed to say. Um, the I, it's probably fine. The interesting thing is like from where we had pre it, 
I think it was like we were all ready to go. And then the trailer for um, what was the Marvel movie that uh, Destin that that Destin did? Um, Shang-Chi. The trailer for Shang-Chi came out and there was a shot in the trailer that, like, I kid you not, was almost identical to our plan for the Mythosaur. And I mean, thank God that it came out in the trailer and got ahead of it because we, we knew we immediately had to pivot. But so then it was like, how do we get that same sort of suspenseful, just enough, you know, of a tease without too much information, but can't, we have to take it in a completely different direction. Um, so it was more the, the cliffhanger of, of how do we do it differently. Um, but that was always the intention was mystery, excitement, and, and really a cliffhanger that would take you into the rest of the season. Being able to make those kinds of pivots are vital. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, yeah. All right, so every Collider Forces will end with this question. It's a little overly sentimental, but I don't care because I think we need to do it more. So in this industry, we give each other awards. That is absolutely wonderful, but I feel like nobody says good job to themselves nearly enough. So whether it's something you accomplished on The Mandalorian or any of your previous titles, what is a scene you can look back on and say to yourself, like, damn, I am proud of what I accomplished there? Ooh, um, I mean, I, I, I think just because we're in it on Mandalorian, um, you know, that challenge of like, how do you get emotion out of, out of a man in a helmet and a puppet? Like I, I found my episode cause I even took a, a significant break for it while they're doing all the VFX. So then to come back to it almost a year later and watch it through, like there are some really emotional moments. And like, I, I think, um, I feel like uh, it was a successful challenge, a challenge successfully completed. Um, so, yeah. And, and, it, and actually just to take it full circle, I think it comes a lot from what Ryan and I were trying to do with close eye lines and connectivity. Like even if you have somebody in a mask, you can just by bringing the camera here and having that look between him and baby, that's really close and connected, especially, I mean, those baby grow eyes, like you feel it, you know? And, and so yeah, that's that's one example. It's a good example. I'll tell you, a half hour was not nearly enough for this conversation. I think I have like five times the amount of questions than we got through, but I will thank you for your time. I'll say congratulations on The Mandalorian and also everything you've accomplished. I look forward to seeing more in the future and the Collider Forces door is always open to you. Thank you so much and thank you for having me.